Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Piper, and today I can say I'm a recovered alcoholic. And I can honestly say that because you guys showed me what that means. And, and our book tells us all about it. So just to um, identify with all of you, right, I'm supposed to focus on step one today. And um, really, my sobriety date is 10-7-2009. However, for those first 10, 11-ish years pre-pandemic, I never relapsed. I never picked up a drink. However, what I didn't understand was that half measures really availed us nil. And I heard in my home group, in my in-person home group, beautiful people sharing great things. I was able to put the drink down, but I heard things like, um, don't drink and go to meetings or, hey, try 90 meetings in 90 days. And, oh, yeah, get a sponsor, get a home group and do service. So I thought I was doing all 12 steps because I read the poster on the wall at every meeting. And mind you, my first year in sobriety, guys, I went to three meetings a day. <laughs> so whatever the math is on that, that's even more than 90 meetings, right? Um, because I was paralyzed by fear. I was terrified of picking up another drink. I really um, had no attention span. I had this thing, and um, I've heard my buddy Terry say it's called ADD, Alcoholic Defiance Disorder. If you tell me what to do, I'm going to put my hand up, and I'm going to be out of here like as fast as I can, right? Because I don't like for anyone to tell me what to do. Anybody identify with that? Yeah. So that's the thinking part of our disease. And I had no clue what really being free meant. You know, I was dancing around, hopping around, chasing other people, places and things for that first decade, because I was like, oh, look at me, I'm not drinking anymore. So I could justify and rationalize all this other absurd behavior, unfortunately, causing great distress to people that I loved because I was walking around with untreated alcoholism that I couldn't even see. So I'll go back a little tiny bit just to qualify myself. And I also want to say right now, I always wanted to travel the world. And I never knew I was going to make so many friends all over the world that I've never met in person. But you guys are like brothers and sisters to me because I see so many of you right now on the screen. And Zoom has just given us this platform to share the solution. And the book tells us, right? The book tells us that if we're the real alcoholic, guess what? In these pages, in these 12 steps that are written in masterly detail, we can discover first whether or not we have a common problem, which would be, are you the real alcoholic? Am I the real alcoholic? And the book's going to show me how I figure that out on pages 20 and 21. And we'll get to that. Um, so, so, and then that, that there's a common solution. So, and I love, thank you, the meeting chairs here that you opened us up with showing us pain, 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 Right. How many of us have been in so much pain that we were willing to drop to our knees and ask for help, even if we didn't believe in God or didn't even know God? I don't know. But all I know is that my bottom, my emotional, spiritual, financial bankruptcy dropped me to my knees in 09, where I didn't know how to pray, but I guess he heard me. (laughs) And you guys aren't afraid to talk about God here. So, um, mind you, I wasn't in the rooms yet, but I cried out to God, right, with my prayer that I learned from when I was a kid. So, rewinding back, right, I grew up in the Midwest in the United States, in Kansas, guys. So, you ever hear of Dorothy Toto, the Wizard of Oz? So, literally, I'm, I'm the Pied Piper from Kansas, who it's like, 
there's no place like home. There's no place like home. And my whole life, all I ever wanted to do was to feel safe and loved and connected and useful and have a purpose. And I didn't know what that was for the first 44 years of my life. I really didn't. And actually, I'll take that back. Let's take two years off now. It really wasn't until I was 55, till I was coming up on my 11th anniversary in sobriety. After somebody took me through the steps, this BYOC group, right? And showed me that my purpose is to be of maximum service to God and the people about me. And I get to do it for fun and for free. And it's not even about me anymore. Nothing is about me. It's about him because guess what? (laughs) My loving creator that I choose to call God, who's up there, if I can plug into him on a daily basis and walk day by day with him, he's going to lead me. He's going to bring people into my life and take people out of my life that are not healthy for me in body, mind, and spirit and say, hey, Piper, come on, we're going to go over here. I think you can help over here. I think you can help over here. Whatever that looks like, literally, honestly, on a daily basis, I surrender and, and, and I just go, I just go with it. And that, and the key is to be able to be present. So going back to when I was a kid, my parents were like the rock stars of my life. They were amazing. They were 19 when they had me, uh, But my dad was an alcoholic. His mother, my grandmother was an alcoholic. My mother's father was an alcoholic. And what did I see? This is, I'm growing up in the 60s, guys. I'm I'm old. (laughs) And I see, you know, movies and movie stars smoking cigarettes, making martinis for their husbands, like all this stuff, right? It's glamorous. And I get to ask to be the bartender at my parents' parties when I'm like seven, eight years old, because I just thought it was cool. And they're listening to Santana and we're dancing around and all this cool stuff, right? And all I can tell you is that my mind already knew that that was the way to kind of like get out of this, uh, this mind that couldn't sit still. I had this thing called the RIDS, restless, irritable, and discontent. I could never sit still. I could never be comfortable living in my own skin because I didn't feel like I fit in. I didn't understand like how I was supposed to get along, but I knew I had some smarts and, and maybe you know, some things to contribute to life, but I really didn't know what that looked like. I thought I was just going to be the best partier and entertainer and, and people pleaser. That's really what I thought. Cause I was the oldest. I had, I felt like I had to take care of my younger siblings. And especially when my mom became a single parent, it was like all of a sudden I, I assumed that role, um, not knowing that it, it really wasn't necessary, but that's what my mind told me. I needed to control everything around me. So I became this control freak, this pleasure junkie, this kid that I'll just go back to at the age of five, my parents are on a date. I sneak into the fridge downstairs. I grab this genie bottle of wine. It looks like um, a, a genie bottle. It's Lancer's wine. I don't know if anybody remembers that. It had the wicker on the outside. And I take a sip saying to myself, oh, it's just grape juice but I knew it wasn't. And I had to open the cork and I chugged the whole thing. What five-year-old chugs a whole bottle of booze and, or lives to tell about it. So just right there, I'm just qualifying myself, that obsession, that allergy, it kicked in immediately that first time right? Because that one sip wasn't enough. I needed to chug the whole thing. I get called upstairs uh, to have lunch with my uh, family. My uncle was home. My nanny was like babysitting, whatever. And what did I do? I took two bites of a peanut butter jelly sandwich and I proceeded to run to the bathroom and paint the walls purple. I think I don't need to say any more, but that's the way I drank. Okay. So now I'm just a kid. Let's fast forward to my teens, go off to school, I'm high school. Again, I find the kids that are drinking and doing other things. And because I want to fit in, I join the varsity sports. But then I also have the, you know, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, where I join the partiers and I'm drinking the same way. And I'm 
painting the walls a color, the same, you know, same thing over and over in my 20s, in my 30s, and I praying to the porcelain, porcelain God basically every night, right? But then I'll go make myself look nice. I'll put the makeup back on and show up wherever I need to show up. And I just kept doing that over and over and over and over again. Well, basically, as an adult, it's really not a pretty look. You can kind of get away with it when you're a kid, you're a teenager, your 20s, 30s, into my 40s. It wasn't, wasn't a pretty look, and it was getting exhausting. So all these lies that I used to tell myself that I'd be able to control it some way, sometime, be able to drink like a normal drinker. I kept trying everything, you know, taking trips, not taking trips, uh, working out more, <laughs> and then, you know, earning the right to drink, whatever it was. And you know why? Because I had these other people in my life that I idolized, like my grandfather, who was a scratch golfer. And he, you know, had the friends they entertained and he showed me how to drink. And then my dad, who was a surgeon and owned a bar on the side, as well as a health club. So as long as I went and I worked out and I taught the aerobics classes and I did what I needed to do, then I could go to the bar and have drinks and learn how to drink like a guy and slam it down on the table. And, you know, like, I just thought I was cool, right? I thought I had arrived. That was, that was my, that was me. And it was all really silly and really not true because ultimately what happened, I was disconnected from the people I loved. I couldn't show up properly at work. I certainly couldn't show up for my kids. And then here we go, fast forward. Um, my husband and I, the marriage is erupting uh, because again, I am run by selfish, self-centered fear and I'm a taker. I'm not a giver, although I can disguise it as, oh, but don't you understand if you just do it my way, I promise we're all going to have a great time. It's all going to be okay. But most people like to be able to run their own lives. <laughs> it's not my job. So the book told me, oh my goodness, I didn't even know. I thought I was, I had to quit playing God. Why? Because it doesn't work. The disease wants me isolated. The disease grabbed me, isolated me from everybody that I loved. They didn't want to hang out with me. They didn't trust me. My kids weren't coming to me for advice. My daughter did all of her college searching on her own because honestly, I was always drunk. I was drunk from the minute I woke up, partying my way all through the day thinking, oh, but I can justify this because my career allows me to entertain clients. And oh, I've got to be able to make sure I take them to this place and that place to be able to sell them this thing or that thing. And la, 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 la. Again, disaster, disaster. So all I can say is, yes, I'm supposed to focus on step one. Wow. Getting back to if you don't know when you're in jail, a friend of mine, Russell says, then how are you going to know you need to get out of jail? So what I didn't understand was that the drinking part of this disease is only 5% of the problem. The thinking part of this disease is the other 95%. So first of all, congratulations, all you newcomers, all of you celebrants right now. You are the most important people in the room. In addition to anyone who's here that might have time that is still suffering from untreated alcoholism. Because I'll just share with you again, going back to my personal experience, my personal life is that uh, I guess I was 16. I, and this is after doing my amends that I could go back and look at this situation and see my part in it now that I'm 50 something years old. All right. When I was 16, I have my first love, my boyfriend. And what would we do? We we say we're going to the library. It's a school night. And we're going to study. <laughs> you think we're really doing that? No, I know how. So what happens? I don't know. It's a Wednesday or a Thursday night. Piper's not home. It's one in the morning. It's a school night. Well, what happens? My parents call the police. Oh my gosh, you know, I caused them worry. I caused them panic. I caused them angst. Of course, I never saw that till I was willing to go back and look and revisit that thing. But where did they find me? Well, they called 
my boyfriend's mom and she's like i don't think they're here but i'll go look and she finds us passed out completely obliviated on top of each other on the sofa right and i don't need to describe anymore but i'll tell you the clothes weren't on so that was humiliating right incomprehensible demoralization and shame and all of that so of course i you know, blocked that out for decades, not really revisiting that till I had to do my thorough inventory. And um, what was my part in it? Well, I carried around a self-pity party thing for decades because my stepfather um, took the phone out of my hand when I was 10, when we moved from Kansas to Connecticut and said, I'm your dad now. Your father doesn't exist. He hung up the phone on my dad. And I'm like, oh, but you don't understand. I'm George's daughter. Like my father was God to me, right? Right. And who's this guy telling me he's my dad now and I'm not allowed to even be so here. There's the hand again, ADD, alcoholics defiance disorder. So all I could tell you is I tried to not come home hardly at all unless my sister and brother needed me. In the meantime, I was finding every way to escape, escape, escape. And I guess what I was getting to is one day I got my stepfather so upset by that whole thing, but I could never see my part in it, that he had a knife up to my throat in the corner of the kitchen. Hmm. Right. Well, okay. Maybe that's, uh, you know, a a situation that had consequences that he he was out of control as well, but I got to look at my part. How did I get him so angry? Well, maybe again, you know, somebody not coming home, having to call the cops, like, blah, blah, blah. All I can say is uh, I had a part in it. And but I called my dad, I wanted to go move, get to know my father, because this man's not going to tell me I don't have a dad. And before I go off to college, I need to go know my dad. I get to my dad, find out again. I've got to learn how to drink like him because he owns this bar. He's got his 16 year old daughter hanging on his right wing. I'm his wing man or, you know, the son he didn't have. So I kind of became this tomboy. Uh, all I can say is I, I romanticized the drink, the whole lifestyle, my drinking career was on its way. The academics were out the window, even though I was capable, I was an underachiever, underperformer until, unless it involved drink. (laughs) And then I was like, oh yeah, I'm a champion here. And I just thought that was cool. I mean, what kind of distorted thinking is that? Again, it's my thinking, it's my thinking, it's my thinking, because I have all these crazy thoughts thinking that, oh, but if I can just do this, or if I can just get that award, or if I can just please him. And so what does my dad do? He's like, all right, Piper, three rules, you're coming to live with me, you get a job, you make the honor roll, and I'll give you a car, right? And so I had a car to get to work, get to school. And what does he do? He helps me find a job as the emergency room switchboard operator at the hospital. Friday nights and Saturday nights from 11 at night till 7 in the morning. (laughs) So his daughter can't go out and get in trouble, right? But Piper, she's crafty. She's creative. Oh, there's a junior college in town. Well, they have fraternity parties Monday through Thursday, so it doesn't matter if I can get there on Friday or Saturday. All I'm saying is, right, we can rationalize our way through anything, right, to go get our drink on, to go do our spree, whatever it is. And I was a master at that, and it wasn't leading me anywhere. So what was that video that we just watched? Have you ever been in pain? Have you ever felt hopeless? Have you ever felt like you're in despair? Oh my goodness, I could raise my hand, raise my hand, raise my hand, raise my hand. And then we go to the big book and it talks about these bedevilments. So before, when I hadn't done the work yet, and I hadn't read the big book with all you guys, and many of you are right here on the screen right now, for the past two years during the pandemic, you know, God landed me somehow with my sponsor who had 25 years, again, who was suffering from untreated alcoholism. We found this group. They took us through the steps in two weeks or less to get rocketed into that fourth dimension of existence, to know the truth, to know there's a common solution, one solution. And our AA program of recovery is from our title page through page 164 in our big book. Guys, this is the path to freedom. This is the path to freedom. And 
And so what does it say? It, on page 52, I was still untreated alcoholic, right? 10 years in the rooms. I was having trouble with personal relationships. And I'll just put this back into the statements. I'll read that. Were we having trouble with personal relationships? We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. And that's not even about money, guys. That's about, I, I didn't feel comfortable living in my own skin. Anybody identify with any of these bedevilments, right? Yeah. It said we had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. This is untreated alcoholism, guys. And guess what? I promise you, my experience is that after doing these steps and getting all the way through step 12, which, mind you, is from page 89 through 164, it's not just chapter 7 working with others. It's the whole thing. And then it's sharing that with somebody else and bringing them through the book bringing them through the book, and so on, and so on, and so on, so that we can spread the message of hope, the solution to people who are sick and suffering of this disease that wants us to go to the gates of death or insanity. We don't have to go there, guys. And I have lovely people in person in my home group, and maybe me, the student, I just wasn't ready. I hadn't felt enough pain. And I just thought, okay, it's an easier, softer way. I can do steps one, two, three, and I'll leave the rest for somebody else because I'm I have sloth, right, in my character defects. I don't want to do the work. It's too much. This book's too big. <laughs> let me go to the living sober meetings. You know, let me uh, let me go to the speaker meetings. I can listen to other people tell their drunkologues because guess what? Oh, I love it. I can identify with that. But I wasn't hearing the solution because I didn't even know there was a solution. So mind you, I'm going back now to the red flags in my own family, in my own experience. I move home. I'm with my dad. I find out my father's mother, who also was a doctor, she's from, she, she, she's from Europe. She spoke eight languages fluently. Brilliant woman. Very sick alcoholic. Again, I didn't know this. I'm only a little girl. But I remember she used to ask me, when I would go on my airplane to see dad and I would be flying on TWA from New York to Kansas city where TWA used to have a hub. She'd ask me to collect all the liquor bottles I possibly could. So here I am this like eight year old, nine year old little girl going around to strangers on the airplane, asking them if I can save their empties. <laughs> like what? Like what? Are you kidding me? Because what I didn't understand was that my grandmother, my Nana, she was filling them and stashing them all around her home because she was an alcoholic and she didn't want my aunt to find it. Who knew, right? Who knew? She also taught me how to search in the bottom of her purse for money, right? So that I could go to the candy store and that was my reward. I'd buy that like candy necklace. That was like one of my favorite things. Uh, at the Woolworth, they used to have a Woolworth then. All I can tell you is that she was like priming me again to steal, to cheat, to lie, to beg, to do whatever I could to get the drink on. Oh my gosh. Like, I didn't know. I knew she loved me, but she was sick. I didn't know she was sick. So what happens? I ask her if she'll come live with us because I found out that there was abuse going on when I moved out when I was in high school. And I asked my dad, it's his mom. I'm like, can Nana come live with us, please? And he said, yes. She comes and I come home from school one day to find her at the bottom of the stairs. Uh, her, you know, uh, passed not well, maybe she was passed out, but unconscious is the word I was looking for with a bottle by her arm, right? She'd fallen down a whole flight of stairs. And all I know is that I called 911. She was taken away in an ambulance and I never saw her again. And then my aunt never let me see her. So again, this disease, it affects the whole family, guys. It's not even just the alcoholic. But thank goodness for the grace of God, somehow I saw a fast forward of what the progression of this disease could look like. 
and I knew she's my blood. And, and I guess somehow that like planted a seed for me that I knew I would never want to do that to my kids. That was terrible pain. So this video thing that you showed, like, yeah, I've seen this, I've seen the pain, I've seen the pain in other people, but I could never see it in me. I couldn't see the pain I was causing to the ones I loved until I was willing to get honest. So here we go back to step one. (laughs) I have to admit that my life has become unmanageable, right? So all I know is I told you already, I got to my knees a year before I got in the rooms, really crying for help because my husband's gone now. I've got two little kids to raise. I have no idea how I'm going to do this, how I'm going to provide them with what they need, continue the lifestyle, this, 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 and that. I'm poor me, poor me, self-pity party, victim, victim, victim. And um, my girlfriend, who's a CCD teacher at the local Catholic church, says, Pipe, there is um, a Bible study kind of thing. It's called the Alpha Course. This guy, Nikki Gumbel, he gives us a video. It's 11 weeks. Guess what? There's free dinner and wine or beer. Why don't we go? It's on Wednesday nights. <laughs> so at least I made it to church on a Wednesday night instead of the bar because my vanity and my, you know, shame is like, well, you know, I'm going through a divorce. I probably shouldn't be hanging out in a bar because I'm going to be worried about what other people are thinking, right? Although I'm like tanked every day anyway, I just wasn't doing it in public. Um, so anyway, all I can say is, is, is something lit the spark of fire in my heart for God after I took this course. And I kid you not, Nikki Gumbel just got me excited about my spiritual, my faith walk from childhood, got it reignited. And he literally just started big billboard signs. Piper, go here, go here, go here. I will tell you what God shot. I'm leaving my girlfriend Deb's house in the winter and it's icy. We got a lot of hills and ice and it's black ice. And I had just decided maybe I should start trying to quit drinking. And, and she was my best drinking buddy. In addition to like my spiritual friend, right. Who got me to go to church. And, um, we're both going through divorces. There were like four of us women at the same time. And all I can say is I see, I get seven minutes, 21 seconds, I'm going to wrap through this, but um, I leave her house knowing that I cannot continue because I'm not modeling anything good to my kids. My mind's insane. I'm spinning out of control. I, 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 I'm panicking all the time. I can't stay focused on anything and, um, and I need help. And I pray to God in the moment where I'm coming over this hill, I'm probably going too fast. There's ice on the hill. I see a car being put onto, um, you know, one of those tow things on the side of the road. Now, there's no room for me to get, the, and there's a car coming up the hill. There's not a third lane in the middle. I cannot put the brakes on because there's ice. And if I were to put the brakes on, I'm going to slide right into either that guy or this guy. And all I know is I said, God, please take the wheel. And I don't know if I had an inch on either side of the vehicle. I said, God, if you do this for me, I promise I will quit drinking and I will go to an AA meeting. Please just save me. And somehow I squeezed through those cars. I don't know. All I know is maybe it was one of those moments where the car like went like this and then went like that. It was power beyond human control. I promise you, I kid you not. So for me, it was like, I can't argue. He's got me. He's there. If we cry out loud enough, he will, he will come to any of us who seek him, no matter what. And honestly, every single day, I, I, I call out to him. I call out because I don't know what I'm doing. I still am seeking to understand, to grow in effectiveness and understanding. And as a result of being farther away from the drink for a longer time, and now, you know, two years of having gone through the steps, and if I'm continuing my steps 10, 11, and 12 on a daily basis, but I have to remind myself every day to go back to step one, 
right? Because again, at any time, like our friend Terry would say, it's like, I'm going to drink no matter what. I'm part of the no matter what club. If I am not spiritually fit, if I am not connected to my higher power, to the God of my own understanding, and I'm not plugged into that source before I even put my feet out onto the floor, I, I'm, I'm going to start running the show. I'm going to start trying to control people, places, and things. I'm going to be taking my stinking thinking with me. And I'm not going to be useful to anyone. Yeah, Terry's putting it in the chat, right? If we do the work, God can work on us. And it's a promise. And it's a beautiful gift. And it keeps on giving, right? Because all I can say is, I love this program. I've fallen in love with the AA program of recovery more than I ever knew how beautiful it was. Because every single day I get to do intensive work with other alcoholics, which is what page 89 says is our insurance policy. It's our way to continue to have permanent sobriety if we do this work, right? So just speaking at meetings or just, you know, making the coffee, that's all beautiful part of, you know, helping out in our meetings, but that's not intensive work. We've got to really work one alcoholic with another alcoholic and if it's all right, I want to just turn to the bottom of page 14. Um, it's so beautiful in here. There's everything in this book, like it's beautiful and comes alive for me today. But I'm going to say um, at a Bill story, um, this is where we can learn to identify and see if we belong here, you know, with these real alcoholics who are getting recovered and helping others. But it says at the bottom of 14, my friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs, particularly was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. Faith without works was dead, he said, and how appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. And if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed. And with us, it is just like that. So on this note, I'm just going to invite you guys to, if you're not sure if you're the real alcoholic, you can turn to pages 20 and 21 and read about the moderate drinker, the hard drinker. And then what about the real alcoholic? Figure out if you fit. And if you're one of us, man, we are here to help you for fun and for free. Put your names, numbers in the chats, get a sponsor, get a home group and, um, and come do this thing with us. It's beautiful. I love you. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.